we have something really valuable that we're tracking here. We're tracking the autonomic functions of sleep. Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7. Welcome back to The Blueprint, where we distill cutting-edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, I am back with Dr. Kathy Goldstein to talk about sleep tracking. Now, this is something that a lot of people are looking at from maybe their Apple Watch or Oura Ring or Whoop. Are these sleep stages accurate? Are they something that you should actually focus on? And if so, what can you do about it? Today is going to be really informative if you love wearable technology and if you love tracking your sleep. Speaking of sleep, if you're looking for actionable tips and recommendations to consistently get restful and fulfilling sleep, then grab a copy of my Ultimate Sleep Cheat Sheet. I got a link in the show notes below. It is my guide for you on the things that you need to focus on every night so that you're consistently falling asleep and unlocking the power, the restorative power of sleep. And also I have napping recommendations. So check that out. The link is in the show notes. So let's get right to our conversation with Dr. Goldstein. Let's lean in and learn from the best. Kathy, I'm excited to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is sleep tracking and the truth behind the data that we're looking at. So you are a world leading expert on this. You've You've got a great stance on it based off of what we know in the scientific literature. What sh If somebody is tracking, what could they pay attention to that actually would give them a signal of like some of the key health behaviors or sleep behaviors and what's made up? Fantastic. Okay. So yes, yeah, so these devices are everywhere and they tell us how much we're sleeping at night. They tell us how much REM supposedly we're getting, how much deep sleep, and they give us these scores about how good our sleep is or, or how we've recovered. The best thing you can look at from these devices is your total sleep time, the amount of time you spend awake at night, and your sleep timing. So those are things you wanna see and you wanna take a look and you wanna look at how they're associating with things like your fitness performance, how you feel, your mood. You're really trending these very simple variables over time. But that's what the devices are pretty good at. They're pretty good at determining if you're awake or asleep. And you can really use them to kind of benchmark your consistency and approve upon that. That's really what we want to see. Another thing is just using them to look for big changes. So COVID was really interesting with these devices because people were seeing changes when they got COVID or right before. People were seeing changes in their sleep and their heart rate variability in response to the vaccine. So mm -hmm. it's really good when you have kind of end of one experiments with these. I'm gonna do X, see how my sleep changes. That's something I'm totally okay with. We've even had individuals who have abruptly seen, you know, deterioration in their sleep and they did come in for medical attention and it turned out they had sleep apnea that was disrupting their sleep at night and increasing their amount of time awake. So they can be very valuable. What about these sleep stages and Okay, let's just say it. It's not accurate. Why do these companies keep reporting it? So, okay, so you're going to love this. So there's kind of like three big things to think about this for, for me. Okay, so first, we're both in the sleep science field. And you probably remember going way back, learning about how they define these sleep stages. REM sleep is defined by brain waves and eye movements. So what we call electrooculogram for the eye and electroencephalogram for the brain. That is how we define these sleep stages. So we're taking EEG defined sleep and try to estimate it based on what? Heart rate and motion. We are literally talking about completely different physiological characteristics. So people cannot expect that heart rate and motion based sleep to correctly approximate a definition that was based entirely on EEG and eye movements. So that's the first thing. The other thing is, Never in the field of sleep medicine and sleep science have we had longitudinal day after day after day recording of different 
sleep stages. So I have no idea of the relevance. So when I have a patient come in and they're like, I feel great, but my Fitbit told me I have no REM. I have no idea what that means in an ambulatory setting because that's not data we've ever had before. And then the third thing is there's not really any proven intervention that can increase one sleep stage or the other. So instead of people making themselves crazy about the amount of deep sleep or REM sleep they're getting and not really having kind of an end game with that, what they're going to do to make that better, just focus on kind of, you know, we always say simple, but not easy. Those simple things that we know improve your sleep quality, things like getting light in the morning when you wake up, things like keeping regular sleep wake timing and things like not eating before bed, et cetera, et cetera, instead of tracking these sleep stages that we don't know if they're relevant, we don't think they're accurate, and there really isn't anything to do with these metrics. It's mind boggling to me that these companies keep reporting on it. I mean, it really is just insane because Pete, they're causing people to be frustrated about something they really can't control. And Absolutely. I don't I think it's dishonest. Now Aura Ring says that they have some AI that's getting closer and closer and closer. And the research I'm looking at tends to suggest they're got somebody's gonna get there with AI, but you would need launch longitudinal studies and you need to be tracking all these other variables and maybe you're 80% the way there or whatever. What do you think yeah, about that? The way I like to think about this is so for so long in this space, we've tried to say, how good can we, how good can we approximate the PSG, the polysomnogram, right. that EEG based sleep? But I say we have something really valuable that we're tracking here. We're tracking the autonomic functions of sleep, right? We're tracking primarily heart rate variability based sleep predictions, right? Mm -hmm. So if we kind of get away from saying, how well can we predict REM? You know, we're 90%, you know, if we really look at what what are these different heart rate variability characteristics? What do they mean for how we feel? And what do they mean for as far as we can impact them? Is this something, you know, we want to improve these with exercise, all of these things. So I think we sometimes are barking up the right, the wrong tree. That being said, I do think Aura is very science friendly. And I think mm -hmm. there's such leaders in this field. And if anybody is to make strides in this area, um, I would expect to see great work from them. And I don't want to dog them. I'm mean, wearing an order ring right now because because the sleep onset and awakening, the only thing for me that is agitating outside of the REM non REM pieces um, is that I move quite a bit when I sleep. And so it mm -hmm. tells me I'm awake all the time and I'm really not. And so that's that's the only thing I'm like, no, I really wasn't awake. But that's that's just some of the error in the measurement. But besides that, I think for most people, you know, if, they, if they've never really tracked it, all of a sudden it brings awareness. But research mm -hmm. does show there's a paper on the frontiers of physiology that with aura rings that shows that it does not change long term health behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you need a, a holistic behavior design model. But thank you so much for shedding some light and, you know, helping people out, out, out there understand like, look, if you have the device, it's great. Maybe look at your total sleep time when you went to bed, when you went to, when you woke up, are you being consistent? Is your duration within the recommended ranges? And, you know, make sure you're not going to bed at two o'clock in the morning. That can impact all sorts of things like depression and all things like that. But it's not be so paranoid about these sleep stages. Yeah, it, it's fascinating to me that, you, that it's very easy to get somebody to wear this device every night to sleep and to have them review all their data, you know, at least once a day, but it's really difficult to get somebody to turn off, you know, their backlit screens you know, one to two hours before bed and set a regular wake time, which are the things that we know would actually help. Thanks again for joining me on the Blueprint Podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, we have one more coming up with Dr. Goldstein. Also, if you have a friend that is obsessed with sleep tracking or loves to learn more about sleep, please share this episode with them. It may impact the way that they view that data coming off of their device. Also, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss another episode. Thanks again for joining me, and I'll see you soon.